Good afternoon, everyone, beautiful people around the world listening to this conversation. I'm so, so thrilled to have one of my soul sisters from the Sacred Wealth Program, Ms. Rebecca Loveless. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Mensima. Thank you How so are you? much. I am well. Thank you for having me here today. It, it's so, so wonderful to have you. I'm so thrilled. Um, you know, one of the uh, things I was thinking of, I was, I was um, looking at the list of people I could bring in. I thought you bring a gentleness and a calmness about you that, you know, oh my God, it makes me calm, you know? So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So you want to share a memory or uh, how we happen to be soul sisters? I would love to. And I love that we can describe ourselves as soul sisters because we met in the Sacred Wealth Circle program mm -hmm. um, led by our Premily Greri, who has been a guest as well yes. on your podcast. Yes. And um, I began working with Prema in 2016 and began coaching with her in 2017 and have, you know, gotten to meet beautiful soul travelers who have come into the program and you came into the program recently and just from that first introduction was so moved by your radiance and oh your power and speaking of women uh, power and grace I, I can see why this is something that you're doing because you embody that and I, I just get such a warm feeling um, whenever we get the chance to to work together and talk together and um, share together on this beautiful journey. Thank you. Um, that was beautiful. I don't know what else I can add to that, but I love the uh, circle because uh, there are so many beautiful, uh, strong women, and we each bring uh, this energy of love, first of all, is one of the most comfortable spaces I've been in. And I think, you know, with Prema leading the group and what she brings in as well, she kind of gets us all together on, on the same wavelength almost. And, you know, we do our thing. So it's really beautiful. Now, this past year has been quite difficult, year and a half going into two years has been quite difficult. And as you, you are an educator and the teacher, um, what is your takeaway? Mm. Yes, it has been quite a couple of, of years. And um, I, I started my career as a, as a classroom teacher in elementary schools with young children. And so I still do some of that part-time and during this time, I, I got called back into the classroom to really help support because things were so challenging and it was kind of a, an all hands on deck approach to really support our young students during mm -hmm. this time that's been really hard for us and, and hard for them in certain ways. And yet seeing the beauty of the resilience of children when they're held in a safe and secure space, they are still allowed to be present as they are. Yeah. And first off, that was such a year of joy for me in that sense of getting to just kind of escape a little bit as best we could in our masks and our hand washing many times a day. <laughs> um, but just being present with young students who still have their curiosity and their desire to learn and their desire to be together with with their friends and their classmates um, was, was, it was a beautiful um, gift that I was privileged enough to be able to give. And secondly, I think, you know, oh, my heart goes out to the teachers all across the world who have been facing these challenging situations. And, you know, one thing is that we do think about how are the children progressing in their learning and, you know, what have they lost? But coming to a place of acceptance of this is where we are. Mm -hmm. We've all been traveling on this time together. 
Right. They, we can't measure against the time that we wish it would have been against what it is. And, you know, really working to not be hard on ourselves for what could have been that just we're here and we're moving forward and um, with love, really moving forward with love. Yeah. For our students, for ourselves in how challenging it is for full-time teachers, you know, on their own in, in a classroom to be navigating everything that we are in our, in our own bodies and, and minds and hearts and being still responsible for some other little humans. Do you see how, um, as you talk about resilience, right, that we've had to step up and adapt to the changes that we're experiencing. No one is prepared for this, right? No one was prepared for these changes. And parents especially have to also go into a whole new uh, place of learning how to teach their kids. Uh, is there some advice you give parents in this uh, period? Because I know a lot of them are stressed out. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm so sorry for the parents who are not meant to be teachers in this way and have you know <laughs> taken on this role. You know, though, doing what you can in regards to school and, and all of those sorts of things. But I was just hearing this other the other day and actually some empirical research about this that parents still need to take care of themselves first. That's right. That old thing about the oxygen mask um, and that when parents and, you know, um, women are oftentimes a lot of the givers and putting themselves far, far aside in order to give and, and love and help everyone be happy and healthy. And, and that when we do nurture ourselves and find, even if it's 10 minutes for a walk or a meditation or a bit of you know exercise and movement, that parents were better able to listen to their children and to hear their children. And what children really need is to be heard and seen. Yes. And so when parents can be available for that beyond the reading, beyond the math, that's what they need in the end. They're going to learn these things as and time, as time goes on. Right. Yeah. 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 So being there for them. It's that's number good. one. I agree with you on that because, you know, most of the times, especially women, we tend to take care of everyone else's needs first. And then we come to ourselves, right? By then we're exhausted and without. Uh, any energy and even to get up and align with something that we need for ourselves and that can be exhausting way to live you know so taking care of ourselves and and also just being in a place of love for the children I think is very important um, you work with literacy professionals yes. can you share you know what you do and yeah <laughs> So as I mentioned, I, I was a classroom teacher at the beginning of my career, and I've always been passionate about language and being able to guide young children on their journey to learning to read and write, such an honor. Um, and I knew that eventually I wanted to specialize in some way in that area. And so I was able to have access to um, a newer method of, of um, learning to understand English, you know, and I, I say a lot when I'm teaching my workshops, you know, what do we all think about spelling and English spelling? It's crazy. Crazy, right? right? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. You try and sound out a word and it just doesn't work. And why are these silent letters? So there was a, um, a person who um, came and brought us a linguistic way of understanding language that not only had all the background of why English is the way it is, but ways that we could teach it to three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, so that English really makes sense from the beginning. And this is a type of word inquiry. So this work I do is structured word inquiry. And it's really looking into the science and the history of our language and the structure of our language. So we all know that English comes from so many different places, Latin and Greek and all of this etymology, but I never learned that kind of thing in school. 
I knew it existed, but this um, approach gave me the power to understand my own language. And I was fortunate enough to never struggle with reading or writing, um, but there are many who do. Mm -hmm. And it's those people who really deserve this true understanding of how language works because what can they go on? You know, if, if Sound It Out isn't working, they're just stuck memorizing and it doesn't work well for them, especially, you know, people who have dyslexia and things like this. So when I encountered this work, it just fit like a glove from my undergraduate degree through all of my teaching. And I knew this is what I wanted to do. And so I left the classroom and I studied hours and hours, you know, taking courses and tutoring, working one on one with students and then moved into this coaching role of supporting teachers um, all over the world, really. So mm -hmm. in a, the school that I was working at, I'm there half time supporting those teachers and students in the classrooms to implement this way. And it's so joyous. The children I are bet. just yeah. filled, yeah, they're filled <laughs> with curiosity because if you have English is crazy on the one hand, you can never ask a question about it. But if you know that there's a story behind a word and a reason for why it's spelled the way it is, there's something to wonder. And that's where the magic really begins. Well, you know, when uh, English is a second language, I would say probably a third language for me. Um, and, you know, learning it in school and, and in Ghana, what we used to do, we had to speak English in school. In fact, you know, during my time, when you didn't speak English, they punished you it, when you spoke your native language, right? So we had to go in there and really study it. And as you were saying, there were times it didn't make sense, um, especially when you have to move from certain la several languages into it, right? Uh, it didn't make sense at all. But what we started doing was creating songs and or um, words that rhyme in a certain way to, you know, help us through that phrasing or forming sentences or understanding what it is that we're trying to um, learn and also share in our writings, et cetera. So what I want to ask you is, so we talked about stories within language. How, how would somebody really begin that process? Mm. Well, it's, it's a great question. And the, the way to begin is really to to talk with someone who has this kind of understanding to start them off on the path. I think that's how all of us who are doing this, we're able to, to just at least take one little workshop with someone or, or there are some you know things online in our community that people can access. But when I first heard um, you know, one of my teachers, Dr. Pete Bowers talking about this, he told a variety of stories, like for example, the number two, one of my favorites. T-W-O, why is there a W, right? Yeah. It's not twoo, our yeah. <laughs> not pronounced. But he was able to just quickly point out that there are other words in English that have sort of a sense of two-ness about them, like the number 12 mm -hmm. and the number 20. And by chance or not, those both start with T-W. Right. Yeah, and there are even other words beyond the numbers, like a twin. And the word between mm -hmm. means two things and you're in the center of them. And there's that TW again, right in the center. And going on and on to things like twilight, which is one of my favorite oh. words, <laughs> <laughs> the time between the dark and that the light. Is right. And seeing that there are stories available like this that explain and support uh, a spelling. And like you're saying music, we haven't even talked about music. It's such a powerful way of engaging with story and understanding as well and memory. Um, so whether music or just storytelling in an engaging way, it's once you get a taste of, wait, there's a way to understand this. I wanna know more, what about this word? And so, you know, looking at etymology dictionaries and how is this word related to this word and things like that. Now, you know, I'll go to a dinner party and I'm the, nerdiest person there talking about <laughs> words in the corner. My partner will, 
you'd be devil's advocate and say, well, explain this word. That doesn't make sense at all, you know, and we'll playfully engage with that. But that's really it, you know, um, a learning to, to, to see that it's not the word sound that's the key to its meaning. It's the word's history. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now you you love languages as I do, um, and I I think I realized that you studied French. Yeah, and Spanish yeah. a bit. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, the how does the Latin uh, languages help? Oh. Yeah, it's fantastic, right? Right. Yes. Because, for example, in, in my experience, um, my ability to speak Italian helps me to really structure English words in ways that I have never uh, thought possible, right? Because it, it also opens up a whole new uh, vocabulary for me. But it not only the vocabulary, but it allows me to understand other languages as well, right? So I'm, I'm now kind of uh, binging on some Turkish uh, soap oh, press. <laughs> I'm jealous, I love that. And, and, you know, for some reason I can, you know, just the sound of the words that I can understand some of it. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, it won't be so difficult if I travel there and, you know, I could say some words here there to get me around town. But I'm coming with you. Let's. let's oh, that would be fun. That would be so yes. much fun. I yes. love that. Yeah, that would be no, so but it's, fun. It's so true that, you know, one of my greatest teachers, um, who is Egyptian born and grew up in England and lives in France now, who taught us this way of understanding English, is like such a shame anyone who only knows one language. You yes. can't understand your own language until you learn another language. I think right. that's really true. And even if you know you don't fully become bilingual in another language, those Romance languages, those Latin-based languages, they, I love what you said about um, giving access to vocabulary, because especially um, all of us, but students too, when they are looking at scientific terms, you know, reading in science or reading in history, and come to bigger vocabulary, if they've seen some of those roots it's like the meanings just pop off the page. Like, wait, right. I know that part. This must mean this with the prefix and, you know, and you can start to make sense of your language without even consulting the dictionary. Um, and it, it does, it does give you access to meanings, understandings, new vocabulary, and an appreciation. So when people do study another language, like, oh, okay, I already know, you know, this, these sets of cognates and things like that. It's well, amazing. studying languages is, is, to me, very important in the sense that, for example, in Ghana is between two French-speaking countries, right? And so what we do in school is we're supposed to be able to talk to our neighbors. Uh, and French is a second language we learn as well as English in school. So at least by the time you finish high school, you have an understanding of French as well, in order to at least have a basic conversation um, with someone from another country, right? Now, Beautiful. I noticed in this country, um, that is not so um, encouraged. Let me use that word. Yeah. How do we get it? as a visionary, and I know you are, uh, how do we get it into our, you know, early childhood programs and, or, you know, at least by middle school, high school, that people would understand a second language? Mm. Well, that's a great question and a big one. And it is really unfortunate that part of the American culture is, is really American centric and being the world power. Why should we have to engage with anything else when we're plainly just missing out on the beauty? And I love what you're saying about communicating with our neighbors. And what if we all knew Spanish and could communicate with our Southern borders um, and things like that? So it's a really important question. And, and I don't know that I have the best answer right off 
a lot of schools do have students engage in middle school and high school. They have to have some kind of foreign language, but I don't feel like, you know, it's taken seriously. It's more just like something to tick off for a lot of people. For, exactly. You know, like, um, okay, it's part of the curriculum, you know, you know, just check off. You took some Spanish in high school and you're done. Yeah. And being the, in those classes in high school, there were plenty of people who, you know, wouldn't even attempt the accent. So they'd, be for whatever reason and maybe they felt really vulnerable about speaking in another language because they hadn't had that experience but they'd sort of mock it in a way or you know pretend to not try hard and what if it was valued as you know this is our world and especially in our current times where we're facing things like climate change that we're going to have to solve together yeah. we could see ourselves as a world and not an individual country, what would it be like to be able to converse with more people? And how would that expand our understanding? Of, you know, I think people like us and the your beautiful viewers who are listening to this podcast who aim to spread love in the world, mm -hmm. I think we need just more of that. More love to more acceptance, to more reaching out to other cultures and traditions and opening exactly. ourselves up to that. Exactly. Now, the irony, though, is, is, and I think it, it is interesting to think that of all the countries in the world, this country has every nationality in it, you know, and so the idea that we can't communicate across different lines is something that should wake us up to um, changing the barriers we have put in place to to prevent us from you know engaging others right yeah. um, because i think it's it's in the engagement that we open up not only our minds and hearts you know but we can do so much more together in yes and it really speaks to the division that is part of our country these days and how can we challenge ourselves to open up to those who have a different viewpoint from us? I, I, I'm finding that a challenge still, um, yeah. you know, to something who might be a more conservative value than I and wouldn't be so open and accepting to others. I think that's some of the big work that we have ahead of ourselves. Well, and so then I come back to you as a visionary, right? And you know, being a coach, um, how do, can we integrate this in, in our narratives moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely hold that vision for uh, a unified world. We have, we have bigger things to, to be and to solve and to create together. So, you know, in my younger years, I feel like I had really high aspirations of, well, let's just do it. Let's just, you know, get everyone on board and we're going to solve all of the world peace and everything, you know, and really coming to understand that number one, it starts with you. And then number two, it starts with my next circle of people who souls who have come into my life. And that if I can support one other person, then I've done something. And that there is just this growing movement of conscious visionary women embodying feminine power as a healing force as a connecting force in the world so when i work in my coaching environment i really work to keep in mind these people who are in my circle this is the sphere that i can influence now these are the people I want to, you know, give my love and attention to is one way of thinking about how to spread my vision. And then a second way is knowing that there's an opportunity at any moment, whether it's a parent I interact with who may have different values than I do or ways of being, whether it's someone I meet in a store or a gathering that I've never met before and I dare to take the chance to open myself up to sharing something loving and forward thinking and encouraging or just being witness to someone else and allowing them to be 
I think those are the best ways that I can serve the world. You know, I can't reach every woman, every human, as much as I would like to, every child. But if I really do give my attention and focus to those who, whose paths I'm honored enough to cross, then I hope that that will just exponentially build. So one, one person at a time, is it? it one is. person at a time and sharing what we know. I know most of the time when we engage with others or we meet others who have different views than we do, what tends to happen is we step back and say, uh-uh, this is not right, you know, person versus just opening up an avenue for the person to, you know, see it differently. You know, in other words, a, have a different perspective as to what is happening. Because if we walk away from each other, then what we tend to do is, you know, leaving everything and saying, okay, this is not my thing to deal with. But if we are in a community, we have to deal with things together. Like you mentioned, you know, climate change, for example, it affects all of us, whether we speak English or not, or, yeah, you know, something I'm really challenging myself to do is to ask more questions in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and when I encounter a situation with someone who has some expresses some sort of different belief that, you know, my judgment is, ooh, that doesn't feel as loving as I wish it could be to mm -hmm. just start to ask the question, oh, can you tell me more about that? Or, oh, can you explain more about how you're seeing it that way? Or or things like that. And that's something that I'm just beginning in, I think, in my trying to step out a little further. And I, I think and I hope that when we ask questions instead of just telling, um, mm -hmm. that it allows the other person to stay more open as well, and that they feel that we really want to engage with them. I, I don't want to shut the other person down. I want to help facilitate like you said, seeing it another way that's that's more embracing and more um, loving. And I hope that the questioning is something that we all kind of start to get better at and improve our practices yeah. on. And, and having more conversations, right? And yes, yeah, some people might shut down in that exchange, but at least if you, as you said, you know, express love, in the conversation, in the words we use, etc., at some point that person would hear. I think, you know, that um, yeah, maybe in that moment I was angry, I was irritated, I was this, but I was able to share something about me or about something that this person can take away, right? And in their quiet moments, that I, I think would, you know. Uh, you hear something and it kind of vibrates, you know, in your head, can't get rid of it kind of thing. Yes, um, I hope that too. I think, well, I may never know what, yeah. and that's another thing. I may never know what effect I had on someone. And mm -hmm. if I don't take the chance, yeah. then there will be no effect. So, yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, I think we should all try at least, right? Yes. Now, I, I actually can tell I get myself in trouble quite a bit. Um, <laughs> You know, because um, I noticed, you know, for example, when I came to this country initially and um, people would say, oh, why do you have an accent, you know, kind of thing. And they would react to me having an accent, you know, but I go to the next step and say, well, if you were able to speak my language, you would also have an accent, you see. Mm -hmm. and it goes back and forth like that. There's no anger in that, you know? Um, and I tell them, if you could speak in, you know, my language as well as I speak English, then we could have this conversation and do it this way. And, you know, it takes, gives a pause for them to reflect and, oh, I never saw it that way, you know, because we come from different parts of the world, but yes, we can, um, so communicate on many levels. Right. Now, the women in, I'm going back to the women again, the women in the program, uh, how do you 
get the coaching started. Mm. Well, in the program, um, you know, everyone is joining probably sparked by some specific reason and conscious business leaders. So many, most people are in an entrepreneurial sort of way and they've come to expand themselves, right? So that they can better lead their mission. Um, so when, when we work with someone, um, I love this philosophy that being an entrepreneur is a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to engage in a spiritual practice, we have to start with the inside first. And it's one thing to think, oh yeah, I'm gonna have a business. And I definitely experienced this when I went out on my own. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have that, I'm gonna offer that. And then along comes all of this other behind the scenes of you know, imposter syndrome and right. productivity <laughs> and being seen and am I worthy and all of those pieces that self-care, you know, how do I not work myself to the ground? creating a business because the business is off if I'm off and nothing's happening. Um, so I love the idea that we're coming to our inner work to um, knowing ourselves first mm -hmm. and seeing where we have blocks and struggles as we engage in um, connecting our, our purpose and our mission to the world. So that's one place I love to start. And Ooh. Yeah, I think, you know, developing through meditation, the ability to hear our intuition, the ability to hear our inner voice that can give us all the wisdom that we need to know when something is not feeling right. And most of all, to be able to tap into something that is right, whether it seems, you know, logical uh, or not. not right yeah and i think that's just such a big thing especially for women to be able to afford themselves the time mm -hmm. to stop to tune in and listen and to hear ourselves and to trust ourselves and the trust i think is the biggest you know for women and really for everyone but for those leading a spiritual path and a path of love being able to trust that what wisdom has come to you is what's going to serve you and the people around exactly. you. Exactly. It's hard. It is hard. And especially when we've been taught to live within certain frameworks, right? And that if you are a woman and you step out of that framework, then you are branded uh, with some not so pleasant uh, names, right? And so it, it forces us it almost to kind of stay put instead of really spreading our wings, right? So true. You mentioned spiritual practice and every guest I've had, you know, had to share some thoughts on that. And, and, and it's relevant in our work, not only work outside of us, but in our inner work. Uh, because without that, I, I don't think we have a strong foundation to survive what is out there. Right? So could you share your, your spiritual practice and what you do? You know, people are listening. Uh, they might um, find resonance in what you say and begin looking into it, you know, for their own uh, benefit. So. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, my spiritual practice begins with meditation and it begins with my own personal connection to what I feel is a divine higher, higher calling, higher purpose. We know that we can use many names for this yeah. God and goddess and divine higher, higher being. Um, and, and I was raised in a Catholic tradition and, and I've moved away from that specifically because, you know, I found more freedom in, in looking at it without so many constructs, but, yeah. you know, I do can still use the word God and I can use all sorts of words, but I've, I've encountered, you know, just different sorts of magical things that have happened in my life that have reaffirmed that there is more than just me. There is more mm -hmm. than just this. And I think that's given me 
the desire to believe and put my faith in something more, um, that there are forces working for our good and working for all of our good, as long as we are working to, to listen to that. So, so my spiritual practice does involve meditation in not only just getting quiet, and I think that's step one. If anyone is looking to just start a practice, to just sit with yourself, whether it's you know on uncomfortable cushions or chair, or whether it's outside under a tree, to just get quiet with yourself and breathe. Mm -hmm. And I love that breathing has become so common. You know, in there is no attachment to any sort of dogma with breathing. Exactly. Breathe. Yeah, and that breathing different forms of breathing have the power to just take us places to calm us to give us energy um, to allow us insight so breathing and getting quiet and i also really have experienced the power of gratitude yes and knowing that this is the highest force that if we can get ourselves into a place of gratitude and i love a practice that we you know in, do mensima where we not only practice grateful for this, but mm -hmm. adding in the why. Yes. I am grateful for the gathering I was able to attend yesterday because I really connected with some new people and I feel enlivened by that conversation. And even as I'm speaking this, I'm feeling more and more energy. vibrant, right? It's kind yes. of energetically raising, you know, yes. the temperature a little bit. And yes, it, raising the temperature. It's exciting. And you know, yes. for example, you know, I can say I'm so grateful um, to be doing this podcast because I meet such beautiful, wonderful women that make my world really expand in ways that I didn't know was possible. Right. That was, you know, I can feel that <laughs> resonating. It's, it's, it's like, oh, man, oh. This, this is yummy. <laughs> it's yummy. It's something we can all do. And it may be hard at first, but you know, you just keep at it. And when you feel that energy, that's right. when magic things start to happen in the world. You know, exactly. that surprising offer, that new friend who comes into your life, an opportunity to go somewhere, new, you know, and, and when that when the magic starts to come, I, I love those times. And you just feel like you can really do anything. And you just and, keep it going as much as you can. Yeah. We all falter. We all fall oh, off. Oh, yeah. Well, if we live in this reality, yes, you know, some things just don't go right sometimes. Right. Uh, but it is life, right? And, and I think sometimes we are so hard on ourselves as women, you know, because, you know, something didn't go right. And, you know, we tend to tighten up, um, you know, and sometimes it even impacts our self-esteem in really stepping into who we truly are. I have definitely struggled with that and I'm still working on that. And, you know, in terms of the practice and going deeper and those are moments of opportunity to go inward again and think, well, what is it that I'm anxious about right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm worried that I won't give this perfect delivery. And some people will think, you know, blah, blah, blah about what I'm doing. And okay, well, <laughs> let's work with that, you know, and let's, let's clear that away because that, then it's just, you're right. I love like how you're saying it just closes us down. What if we didn't share? What if none of us shared yeah. what we had to offer? Uh, or reason? who would listen to me or, you know, yeah. but I think the, the power is in our stories. Yes. Right? It doesn't have to be written a particular way it's unique to each one of us and we don't know with whom our story will resonate exactly yeah it's not a mark you know it's um i think also we we've, we've been attached to um the external outcomes versus the inner outcome right so um with the external outcome we count in numbers really mm -hmm. um like you know how many more people makes me but it's just one person really at one time i i know you mentioned this earlier right mm -hmm. you know, spreading the love one person at a time mm -hmm. and then it really opens up other new ways 
Absolutely. So we've all been um, younger, and I'm thinking of some of my younger days um, and some of the uh, trouble I got in for knowing or not knowing certain things, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to have known you then. Oh my goodness. I don't know what I've changed that much. You know, it's like um, really touching life, you know, and experiencing it. And I'm curious about what something could feel like, you know, and I don't do anything dangerous or, you know, but it's just the excitement of it because I want to learn, you know, some food, from another country or culture or tradition, et cetera, or even religious practices. You know, I love those things because it opens me up more. Yes. Um, so what can we share with young girls? Ooh, well, <laughs> yes, we definitely need to support, support our younger girls. You know, something that I'm really encouraged about is seeing in the younger generation right now how they are really working to break down gender constructs. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a, some big power awaiting in doing that, that our girls can be freer mm -hmm. to be who they are. And maybe we will do away with some of this labeling, you know, like you were saying, that happens when a woman steps forward and then they're labeled bossy or you know all of these negative things when they express their power and 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 knowledge i think that i hope that that generation continuing to work together to yes. step forward to not be quieted down um you know the marches that have happened with our young people i have never seen anything like that that wasn't happening when i was that age yes right? exactly right yeah so I hope that we can support that generation in continuing to speak out and move forward so that they all have that place um, available to them. I think that's it, one thing. Is there an avenue for to share the wisdom? I mean, I know we have technology now and you know, in, in so many ways, I mean, I think even before COVID, I wasn't thinking of having meetings on Zoom, et cetera, right? And here we are, it's become the norm. And so as creative as these young girl, girls, women are, you know, technology could be one of the avenues to really share the wisdom because I see that in, in, in this system when we've become so um, individual in our approach to life versus the community uh, approach, that we can also find a lot of young girls who become isolated, True. you know, and therefore they get hooked or channel whatever anxieties they have only online. Yes. Right. Um, and and as we form in the sacred feminine power base, you know, that's what I'm yes. thinking we could call that. I love it. Uh, is how do we connect on a deeper level in order to, you know, to avoid some of the separations that are occurring in our experience? Yeah. And what would it look like to still have our older women, mothers, and other mm -hmm. strong women in our young people's lives connect with those? I'm thinking about teenagers, especially, mm -hmm. and even younger um girls to have a mentor to have someone trusted to go to and talk about their their feelings with right and yes. i do have some some teenagers in my life who um are doing well but they still feel the pressure of the social media and the anxiety and just sort of a pervasive level of of anxiety that seems to be hovering in our culture now and I felt encouraged that they've felt comfortable coming and talking with me, with other adults about their experience so that they can let that out and they can either have support from an adult or even just 
gain some more language and perspective about what they might be going through. So I think you're right. I think social media is a is a wonderful platform for so many things, but we must also continue to push in to our younger girls' lives. And even if they're, you know, on that screen and they don't want to look up, it's like, no, nope, we're going to put that down now and we're going to go outside and, and we're going to have these opportunities for talking and, and connecting. I do think that's very important for our young people. They can't do it all on their own. No, they can't. And I think one of the ways we can do this is have a, a shared valued system that you know there are common values that we pass on to the next generation and they pass on to the next you know because that then creates a seamless conversation about what is right and what is wrong and what can get you to the next step up of you know without feeling the pressure so much it it i think it takes away some of the pressure yeah. you know, that is placed on, in you know, girls in general. I, I'm, I mean, I want to say, I don't want to exclude the boys, as, you know, but it's not a gender thing. In our young, gen, you know, generations, you know, for them to really experience a community with, with a value system that is that spreads across this, you know, um, whole landscape, right? Uh, it's from such a challenge, isn't it, in yeah. this country where it's created on have your own value system, have your own beliefs, do what you feel is right for your family. How do we create that shared value, just like a core essential value system? Values. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be that way, I think, right? And I, I've read some things you were talking about how, um, you know, belonging to church, mm -hmm. that attendance has fallen so much in our country that that used to be the place where a set of core values was established, but where people's spiritual beliefs have changed and their, the way that they choose to practice has changed, there isn't that community central place that is expressing those values. And so how do we do that? How could parents get together with other like-minded parents and form their own communities where they are having a good time and playing and things like that, but also talking about some of these core values. Values, exactly. And in knowing that if my child came to your home, they would experience the same values that I teach them in my home, right. et cetera, right? So that it, there's some consistency in that approach. Those are some other brave conversations, I think. Yes, a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, we're doing it, right? You know, we have a lot of strong women and powerful women uh, in our group. And I think, you know, in so many varied ways, as talented as, you know, uh, we are, that we can bring those out there for people to really engage in. Yes, absolutely. So, we can do this. Yeah, we can. I believe so. I trust that we can. Yeah. At least make things better. Right? Yes. So if I were to ask you your vision for women and children, now you work with both groups, right? So uh, what would it be in the next few years coming? The, the word that came up for me is really empowerment mm -hmm. and that we continue to empower our girls and our sisters, our women, adult sisters in living the life that they feel called to live, speaking the truths that only they can see. And, you know, as we in our circle step forward into our other circles and live in a more empowered way and hope to encourage others to step out and try to live in that empowered way as well. I think we need women's voices so yes. much. And only by standing together side by side, fighting all of the cultural past and oppressions that we've had and still experience, I think standing by each other is, is the way. So yeah. women supporting women, right? Absolutely. It's critical. To me, I think one of the things that 
alarms me is when I see women attacking each other for things that should be a common um, conversation. Um, for example, when we talk about women being assaulted, you know, um, violence against women. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a conversation that should distract us from what that is, right? It shouldn't be based on ideology that violence against women is wrong. Full stop. Full stop. It shouldn't be because you did this and because of that and because you, you know, and unless we get into that core narrative of, you know, expression of what it is and united on that front, we are never going to be able to resolve the issues about violence, mm. you know, in our, in our experiences, whether it's during wartime or even regular time. I mean, you could go out in the evening and somebody could assault you, but then when you bring it up to talk about it, you know, people say, oh, but you shouldn't have gone out at that time, or you shouldn't, I mean, it, it, I think we should get asked stories right and what our, our views are by these core issues right in order to be able to solve them. because if we have one faction of or one group of women saying one thing and another group of women saying one thing then what we do is to create um we make ourselves firstly more vulnerable but then we we create um a vulnerability within the, the conversation that we can resolve because we give the other side the uh, opportunity to say, well, look at them. They can't even agree on a simple thing like this. Uh, now that's such a powerful thing that you've said and to point out that women are not yet aligned in a very basic idea that our safety cannot be violated under any circumstances. Circumstances. Yeah. Period, right? Yeah. yeah. And what would it take to get us all aligned on that very basic page? And I hope that continuing this conversation of you're a woman and you're, you're worthy of being a full human yeah. in whatever culture it is that you live. And there's a lot of work, obviously, to do all around the world on that front, but do you think that it starts with this sisterhood continuing to empower? Yes, yes, I think. Because we should get on the same page about simple things, you know, and, and you know, what beauty is, what uh, sexuality is, what, you know, however we want to express it, that nobody should impinge on us, you know, when we express ourselves in a certain way. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we spent almost an hour together. <laughs> wow, can you believe that? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I invited you as a woman of power and grace. And as I said, you bring this uh, calmness and confidence, what I would say, quiet confidence about you that is just uh, refreshing. I, I love that. <laughs> And so, you know, I want to ask you to close, who is a woman of power and grace? Hmm. I'm so honored to be seen in that way and to feel like I have moved through my life in a way where I could call myself that as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you, first of all. And I, I think that a woman of power and grace is a woman who is working to be most fully in her authenticity. So she is someone who is doing the brave work to dive inside and know herself more deeply. And that is challenging work. And I've seen some dark nights on that path, <laughs> but knowing that, that going through those dark nights is where we find the beautiful gems on the other side. Mm -hmm. And those are times that have led me to know that I am enough, no matter what, no matter relationship, no matter job, that I am who I am and I have things to offer. 
and a woman of power and grace learns to love herself intimately because we do have to love ourselves first and foremost yes. and i do believe that's a lifelong journey um that we can continue to know ourselves more intimately but a woman who is is able to at least begin to do that steps out into a room and exudes that power and grace that encourages her fellow women to stand beside her oh that's beautiful now you know um i would tell you if i met someone who told me that they haven't been in any darkness i'll run away from them because you know i don't think it's possible right so it's not uh, possible yeah it's not possible but it, it is where we emerge even more beautiful we come from that place even more beautiful and even more powerful because we our understanding of this life uh, grows in so many different dimensions you know and experiencing the multi-dimensional ways of being, you know, which I think is necessary for our ascension. I, you know, mm -hmm. to different levels of being. So I agree with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. I really, really love this conversation, and you know, I hope our uh, listeners also take the gems, as you said from this uh, conversation and apply those that work for them as well and share it, right? Yes. Share, share the information and you know let others also benefit as well. Thank you so much and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for having me, Mensima. You're very welcome.